god. Oh my god. A collab moment. Hello. Yes. <laughs> Hi. My name is Yenna. It's Nathan from Nathan <laughs> Snook. And look, we're here in the same place. We're in the same time zone. Yay. <laughs> Incredible. And we're going to do an incredibly cringe the bar and the bookcase tag. I've always wanted to do this tag ever since I first started watching BookTube. This is going to be fun. Yes. Fun. We've got a really good list of books for you. Isn't it so fun? Like the yeah, prompts are yeah. really thought provoking. Yeah. Jalen, you did a really good job. And we came prepared <laughs> as well. And we're drinking. <laughs> we're, we're having too much fun. These are old yes. fashions. They're very strong. Yes. Way too strong. So, first prompt was an old fashioned historical fiction. Oh crap, I forgot the orange peels. Oh. That's okay. We're, we're already in the swing of things. I chose Orlando by Virginia Woolf. It's about a man who turns into a woman who travels through history. I loved Orlando. I just thought it was like one of the most progressive novels for its time and Wolf is just really heady and really big brain energy and to think up a novel where you change sex and change time periods and history is incredible. My pick is so lowbrow and so like mass market mainstream compared to Orlando Virginia Woolf because this is The Crimson Petal and the White by Michelle Faber. Have you have you read this? I have not, but I, I know who Faber is. I had no idea who Faber is. I had no idea about this book. It just came into my life. I think I was a teenager when I read this, and I am 36 now. And the fact that I still remember that the protagonist is a Victorian prostitute named Oh shit, what is her name? Sugar. With her Did you forget that? With her papery skin and that her main man William Rackham like searches her because he wants some like but stuff like the fact that my brain still retains this information just says how fun this is. We've got two different kinds of old fashions here, apparently. <laughs> Love that though. Uh, prompt number two. Prompt number two, we got sidecar, book with a strong supporting character. Nathan, what did you pick? I picked Raise High, The Roof Beam Carpenters, and Seymour, an introduction by JD Salinger. Mm, wait, spoilers? I feel like if you haven't read this you should read a perfect day for banana fish first and then you'll realize why i chose a strong supporting character but is also not they exist yet they don't at the same time and that's why i picked it but yeah classic jd salinger if you love following family sagas um, Salinger does a really good job with the Glass family. It's all he ever wrote about. And yeah, you get theology, you get spirituality, you get philosophy, all in this. In this like existent, non-existent character. Mm. Yeah. Oh, Which, how mystical. We love mysticism here. Uh, totally. Oh my God, again, I'm going to come in super low brow, guys. <laughs> And throwing in some TJR at you. <laughs> this is Daisy Jones and the Six. Are you familiar, Nathan? I, I am familiar. <laughs> you know, I'm, I struggle with Taylor Jenkins Reid. I hated Evelyn Hugo. But I read Daisy Jones and the Six first, and I really liked it. Like, I thought this was just, like, one of those Target dollar book stuff that I mean, you buy was. in the bin. I mean, yeah, it kind of was. That's where I found her. But, like, I was surprised at how entertaining this was the supporting character of Camilla she just is the one character that is like the constant hum underneath mm -hmm. like all of the different layered notes of each character within this story her end in the book I really loved it just tied everything together for me personally and made this book that much more enjoyable when I was already ready to kind of skip out on this so so cheap tale. Like, I feel like Camilla made this not cheap. She elevated the story. And I left reading Taylor Jenkins Reid thinking, oh, she's she's got some legit stuff here. She's not just like a cheap bitch. I like that though, because when, when you have like a strong supporting character, I think it is really interesting because you realize that like a writer cares about all of their characters totally and not one is dismissed or made 
just a one-off just to make plot better. You know the writer's like taking care of all of their people. Jalen. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yes, real cheers. <laughs> Nathan, Yo, I'm so yeah. excited about this next prompt, which is Manhattan, a yes. book set in New York. Because I could think of so many different ones for this, mm -hmm. but I chose. Before you pull up another like super thinky book, I'm going to pull up this YA. <laughs> Permanent Record by Mary H.K. Choi. We love her. She's a queen. All of her book covers, just exquisite gorgeous. and gorgeous. gorgeous. And I mean, look at that eyeliner. <laughs> this book is so New York. It's one of those kind of cringy, the city is like a second character type of narrative. He works at a bodega mm -hmm. and he comes up with all of those like different combinations of snacks that yeah like becomes a thing. Little details like that really like puts you in New York. They mention the bacon, egg and cheese, mm -hmm. all in work. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Little details like that is what- It really puts you in the city. Like all the details in it, all these tiny details really makes you feel like you're in New York. There's a side bit about somebody getting into NYU, but without like a scholarship. And mm -hmm. there's like a strong Asian mom who's there to say, that's not the same thing as getting into NYU <laughs> if you don't have a way to afford it. Just so many details, like the things that the characters say that they do is so inherently New York to me that I had to talk about this book for this prompt. Yeah, but everyone, you should read Mary H.K. Choi. She, she's fun. Emerges in Contact, also very good. I loved Yolk. Yeah. Yeah, I loved so sweet. Yeah. Are all of them YA though? They are, right? I think she's technically a YA, YA writer. writer. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. like, if this is the level of YA writing, like, wow. Yeah. We have come a long way since I was a YA yeah. person. <laughs> Especially for like Asian American YA. Like, totally. It's... I was blown away. Yeah. My my Manhattan, book set in New York. I had to choose Just Kids by Patti Smith. It's just this beautiful relationship between her and Robert Maplethorpe and them just walking the streets being those penniless punk punk <laughs> trying artists and they truly live that in their dirty roach infested apartments and it's so inherently new york like it breathes and breeds the city that itself. would have been like the 70s right yeah oh my yeah. god yeah amazing time have you ever seen that question like if you could travel to to any time and place where would you go because I'll, I'll say mine first because okay, I've already okay. thought it up. 1960s New York, like during the civil rights movement when Vietnam was happening, but then mm -hmm. there was also like the beatniks. Mm -hmm. I, is that correct? Yeah. The beatniks. And like one of my favorite painters is Alice Neal. And that's when she was like starting and living in that time and place. And she li like lived across from the ACLU in Harlem. I would have loved to have been there. Like in art, Jackson Pollock was like mm. king. Ooh, I don't you know. know. Maybe a decade or two after. Oh, that. like Patti Smith time. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I think about like Fran Lebowitz, who's oh, still around. Yeah. And she met all of those people like during the Warhol, you know, factory era. Interview magazine. And interview magazine, and just met all these really incredible people, and all of these incredible people were doing incredible art at that time. So. Maybe that time. Nathan, I feel like we would be the same time and place now, just like, oh my God, right. <laughs> like 50, 60 <laughs> decades earlier. Right. In New York. Just In New York, like, and we'd probably be like bitter, <laughs> like chain smoking <laughs> bastards. Mm, that would be us. Bloody Mary, Nathan. Bloody what Mary. What book messed you up? What book messed me up? It's The Exorcist by William Peter Blatty. I read the book right after I watched the movie, at the ripe age of 13. That was a mistake. I, <laughs> yeah, I would say the book is a lot more demonic, Catholic rich, and terrifying because it combines those aspects. And just like really fucked up my 13 year old self. I can imagine, yeah. yeah. What, would you, what was your pick? Oh, I feel so, I feel so good because I'm gonna do a slightly higher brow pick than you. Human X by Hong Kong. Have you heard about this book? Yes. 
It's about the Gwangju uprising in South Korea. That is a real event that happened in history. This book is a piece of fiction told in a mystical way to ease your soul into opening up to take in this book, this horrible time and event in history. I read this in one or two sittings and after I finished, I, I like desperately needed a hug <laughs> and immediately like had to read frivolous cookbook written by a frothy white woman. <laughs> this is so good. I, like I, I recommend it to everybody wholeheartedly if you haven't heard about it. It's definitely worth a read. It'll fuck you up. It, w it definitely will. But I love that. I love that. I, I, we should all get fucked up every now and then. <laughs> what do we have next? We have an espresso martini. What book kept you up in the night? What book kept me up in the night? Oh, wow. <laughs> is I that know... your original copy? Yes, this is my original copy that I read at like 15. <gasps> Show the good people the wear and tear of look that. Look at that. <laughs> look how yellow it is. Look, look at that. It's, it's loved. I it's vintage. This, like, all the wear, I did myself. I bought this new. Yeah. The Wind Up Bird Chronicle by Haruki Murakami. You know when you're 16, you had your Murakami fix and you know, you're so Japanese pilled <laughs> and you just are obsessed with Murakami. That was it. I read this then. I loved this. I could not stop reading it. Sort of magical realism and falling into the well and not knowing what time it is. I forgot what time it was while reading this book. And yeah, just the directions that Murakami takes with like historical fiction as well, magical realism. Yeah, it's just a really fun book that kept me up. I know a lot of people didn't like it, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Murakami killed, okay? At 16, I was obsessed. I was obsessed and I just ate this up real fast. TBH, I heard about that book when I was 16 too, because like that was the book that everybody was like hyped up on, yeah. right? And I think I started reading it when I was like 20, maybe like 24. Mm. And you know how we were talking about no DNFing books? Like it's a, it's a flaw of ours, but uh -huh. that is like the one book I vividly recall DNFing. <laughs> I mean, I don't remember anything about it. I just mm. remember not vibing with it. And so I was like, I don't need to finish this. <laughs> I've yet to read, like, I've yet to read a Murakami, like, straight through. So I intend to, like, at least one. Oh. But that one was a, a no for me. <laughs> but, Nathan, let me tell you, two years ago, mm -hmm. when I was sick with COVID, I started The Days of Abandonment by Elena Ferrante. Pretty slim, so I was able to finish this in one sitting, like, mm -hmm. all night. Oh, it kept me up <laughs> because of the patriarchy <laughs> nothing like the patriarchy <laughs> can <laughs> keep a woman up in the night all hot and bothered <laughs> there are so so many <sighs> humiliating scenes for this woman for women that i appreciate it because they are so normal and everyday and banal nevertheless so humiliating and that's what this book is about generally what Elena Ferrante books are about but the days of abandonment is one of my favorites like this book was one of the times when I realized I love Elena Ferrante mm. I will stay up any night with her is that your favorite have you read all of I have. I've read all of the Elena Ferrantes. I have to say that the Neapolitan mm -hmm. novels are my favorite just because like the scope is amazing. The show is really amazing. But if somebody's never read Elena Ferrante and they want like a taste of Elena Ferrante, I would definitely say this is a good taste. Can I borrow this? Thing? Yeah. Wait, really? Yeah. Oh my god. Really? I love you. Oh my god. <laughs> oh. I haven't read any Ferrante. So I this... <laughs> This would be really nice. Cheers. Cheers. Sazerac. Oh, a Sazerac. Nathan, what book left you disoriented? Book that left me disoriented. Taipei, Tao Lin. Take a look at this cover, y'all. Yeah, it's, do it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. I think I've talked about Tao Lin on my channel before. He came from 2000s early internet 
writing took a lot of drugs during that time and this sort of maps out his drug intakes in a fictional fictional sense there's just emotions and feelings in here written that i didn't know could be written about even feelings that i've had but didn't know how to fully express it's set in new york a lot of it takes place in the early ams and weird odd afternoon hours and that's what makes it disorienting it's like Falling asleep late afternoon, waking up, realizing it's super late, like too late to eat dinner, yet too late to go back to bed. It's kind of like that. I totally understand what you're saying. Right? Yeah, yeah. those That's vibes. What, yeah, this is what, yeah, most disorienting read. Did you like it? I don't know. <laughs> I think it just like affected me in this like really odd disorienting way. We always appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? What disoriented you? I mean, who else but Otessa Moshfeg <laughs> consistently disorients us all. And this is my favorite Otessa Moshfeg, Eileen. I picked this one in particular because, have you read Eileen? I've not, but I'm going to read it this year. Oh, so no spoilers, but there is a particular character that comes about towards the end whose side you may or may not be on. I felt like it was a controversial take that I was supportive of this character and I felt terrible for being on that side. It made me question like, what does that say about me? Why am I on this person's side? This book was not only fun, but it had me questioning my, my own morals and uh, rights and wrongs. This was so fun, not a spoiler, but but one of my favorite details of Eileen is the main protagonist, Eileen Dunlop, wears lipstick every day mm -hmm. because her lips are the same color as her nips and she would feel so obscene if she were to walk around with her bare naked lips. I love that. I, Otessa Moshbeck is so good at like planting those types of banal but like grotesque details in her stories so good that is so much fun <laughs> so oh my god i'm so excited to read eileen now the long island iced tea what book is doing too much but bonus points if it works anyway no bonus points for me <laughs> unfortunately it was actually my first dnf of the year but it was spiritless but actually not by kyle mitchell a collection of short stories that centered around sort of the minutiae of the world, but it felt very debut-y. There were no happy endings in the sense that like, you didn't know what to do with any of these characters because they were so trapped in their own nothingness. The dialogue was kind of atrocious. Mm. Okay, there was this one story about this stripper who was trying to find the man of her life at her workplace. And she unironically used the word daddy mm. a number of times. And also, ha 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 ha, was like written out. Oh. Like laughter was like actually written out. And yeah, I just couldn't. It was doing way too much. Not for all the right reasons. What about you? Well, I will take the bonus points because... The Pisces by Melissa Broder. Melissa Broder, I feel as a writer, just is perfect for this category because girlfriend is always like stuffing in as much as possible in everything i mean like this is not that thick it's not that long of a novel but you've got depression it was jaylen always say dwm depressed woman mm -hmm. moving mysticism in the form of a carnal romance with a merman <laughs> you've got um yes. We've got thoughts on loss and grief. You've got LA moments, like yes, they are like West LA moments, you know, cause we are at the beach after all, but <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> and it all works. Like I love Melissa Broder. I love everything that she packs in so much emotion, so much incredulity of life. <laughs> Ooh, your favorite. Oh my God, my favorite. Your I favorite. love a Negroni. And you also love love triangles? I do love love triangles. So do I. I picked an unconventional love triangle story. Bonjour Tristesse by Francois Sagan. Is it in French? I do have a French copy <laughs> at home, but I, you know, I feel like most of us read English here, so I chose my English copy. 
but homegirl wrote this when she was like 18. I know, isn't that fab? Yeah, wait, have you read this? <laughs> I haven't, but I want uh, to. Oh my God, take this. <gasps> yes. <laughs> you will take this, please. It's, uh, I read it as a teen and I just absolutely loved it. But it's about this older woman, this man, and F Francois in like fictional form herself. But the man is her daddy. <laughs> it's her daddy. But it's like in this like really interesting friendship kind of way where she loves him as a best friend, but she loves him as a dad. Mm. And just seeing this woman who enters into their life ruin everything in a way. I totally gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. She, she slips into little shenanigans where she tries to uh, get rid of her. It's just written in that like beat, fast paced, lyrical way that an 18 year old expresses their life, but not in like a really pretentious way. It's just a lot of fun. Oh, I can't wait. What did you pick for your Negroni? One of my absolute favorite books is Nana by Ayazawa, who is, in my opinion, god of all mangakas. And there is no fewer than three love triangles in the story of Nana. <laughs> And That's I mean, a lot of triangles. That is a lot of triangles. It's a shoujo, like a manga story typically for like young girls and mm -hmm. supposed to be sweet and cute and all of that. But like the narrative of Nana takes you in some surprisingly realistic dark turns for a story for young adults. It really teaches you about life, about friendship, about how to navigate young life, maybe because I read Nana when I was in my teens, early 20s. This resonates with me so much, like more so than like Sally Rooney. <laughs> mm, so, I mean, if you want love triangles, definitely check out Nana. <laughs> Sounds spicy. <laughs> it is. I love that. Bay Breeze, a light, chill, heartwarming vibes type of book. We are talking my wheelhouse here. So, would you like to go first? Of course. I have to bring up a british a british story which is kind of funny this is 84 charing cross road by helen Hanf. helene is an american jewish girl or it's a book all about letters of correspondence between her and a british bookseller in england oh. it's so charming like just letters in general like from a bygone era to begin with it's letters over a period of decades where yeah. they're just building this relationship via typewritten letters sent across the pond and they grow up together. They send each other like Christmas gifts of ham. <laughs> Eventually, like they end up visiting together. And it's just one of those instances when, much like this, where you meet somebody that you never otherwise would have met and <laughs> it becomes an IRL thing. So this is this is one of those books. It's so good. For my babies. I chose Summer Crossing by Truman Capote. I don't remember what happens <laughs> in that book, <laughs> to be honest, but yeah, I just remember this like light airiness from it. Definitely like a beach read just with Capote's prose. And he, I think this was one of his first novels. It just has this like ultimate adolescence to it. And it has youth, it has that sharp, beautiful prose, light airy, unpretentious. Modern Ajima has a beautiful <laughs> modern home. Look at this fireplace. <laughs> Next we have Dark and Stormy. It's a book dark, that's dark. Thrilling. Um, menacing. menacing. Bonus points if the setting matches. <sighs> well, kind of. I, like the book that immediately came to mind was Paradise by Fernanda Melchor. Ooh, I've heard and the then, people talk about this. Yeah, Dark and Stormy though. This was a hurricane season, her previous book, right? It's dark, it's thrilling, it's menacing about these two boys who are trying to find ways out, different kinds of ways out, but it's like dealing with machismo, it's aggressive, it's sweaty, it's violent, and just the things that these two do together and to other people. Yeah, I kid you not, I had to like take a nap after reading this because it was a lot. It's really menacing. What about you? My pick is very similar. This is A Manual for Cleaning Women by Lucia Berlin. And I have not read Paradise, 
but would you and you have read a manual for cleaning women mm -hmm. you love a manual for cleaning women anytime anyone ever asks me for a book recommendation i'm like it's this it's this you everybody just read this <laughs> and would you say that they're very similar it sounds similar a manual for cleaning women because like to me when i think of lucia berlin's writing a lot of them are mm. set in like the western landscape like the wilderness people living on the outskirts mm. who, who are vulnerable there is a thrill like a menacing thrill i feel in each and every one of her stories because her own place is vulnerable yeah i agree but i feel like she writes them with like such humanity oh absolutely as well. but they are when you think about it uh, lucia berlin was an alcoholic too and she writes through all of that and she writes about how hard that is and but then it also like bleeds into these other characters that she writes through and gives them the humanity that i feel like she didn't give herself totally. as a person yeah but it is it is menacing and thrilling these like sort of lost landscapes and parts of america that that you don't really hear much about, that exactly. you don't hear those stories, and yet all of them feel so hauntingly beautiful. Yeah, haunting and beautiful. Everybody read Lucia Berlin. <laughs> She's a fantastic short story writer. Like, do not read Raymond Carver. If you like Raymond Carver, though, you'll love Lucia Berlin. She's fantastic. Her prose is fabulous. Manual for Cleaning Women. She's right. She's right. <laughs> We're at the final Oh prompt. no, we're done. This video will end soon. Well, let's, let's get to the last prompt. It is the martini, the classic. Nathan, you're Do not you a like... classics boy, right? Uh, mm. I'm not. Mm. I'm a classics gal. So yeah. what, I'm so curious, what is your classic pick? I was gonna ask you though, do you like your martinis with lemon or olives? You can have a martini with lemon? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. I don't even like a martini. <laughs> oh, do you like olives? I don't. Oh, okay. <laughs> I did not choose a proper classic, but whenever we think of LA writers, we think immediately Didion in her like LA years or Eve Babbitt's, maybe Bukowski, if you really think about it. But everyone always forgets about John Fonte, um, a classic LA writer that, yeah, is always overlooked. But here, I do not have my English copy, but it's Rêve de Bunker Hill, <laughs> which I think is Dreams the LA, Upon... The LA classic you have the French edition for. <laughs> I know. Well, he's really fun to read in French, though, because he just has this beautiful lyrical prose. It almost sounds like song when you read it. And it's sort of like that lonely cowboy song, but in Hollywood. But... This one is a classic because it takes place in LA during the 60s about the classic crying artist, Penniless, trying to make ends meet by being a writer. There's some classical scenes where he calls out another writer and then runs away and hides in a parking lot. How can you not love that? We love that. We love that. So, John Fonte, Dreams from Bunker Hill, Ask the Dusk is also a really good one if you need to read Fonte. What's your classic? Well, who would I be if I didn't push an Agatha Christie? And then there were none. My personal favorite, I think we all know that and then there were none is not the original title for this book it is a piece of its time but even within that there's a lot to unpack within this story there is a great great video that I will link down in the description box that goes over that whole thing that I'm trying to describe right now about this book. Regardless of 20th century and beyond racism, and then there were none as a story, as a plotline, as a character study of, for lack of a better word, stereotypes within humanity. It's such a fun, it's such a insightful, it's such a thoughtful piece of writing that I hope wholeheartedly recommend for anybody who wants to try an Agatha Christie or who just wants to try reading a really good quality piece of mass market 20th century fiction. Wow, I've not read Agatha Christie, so I think I'll start with that. 
I wish that I could give you this copy, but this is like my original <gasps> copy. I mean, it looks yellowed. It's and... vintage because you made it vintage. <laughs> I am the only one who made this baby vintage. <laughs> I mean, also that cover is just gorgeous. Yeah. Like, that's, I love that. Cover. They don't make this anymore. Nathan, this was so much fun. It was a lot of fun. It's always fun just talking about books. This was lovely. This was. Yeah. Yes. That was our bar in the bookcase tag. Thank you, Jalen. Thank you, Modern Ajima. <laughs> lovely list of books. Hope you read them. Let us know if you read them too. And then, yeah, talk to us. <laughs> DMs are open. Comment section open. I never know what to say in my outros. Like, <laughs> they're just like minutes of silence. And then it's just like <laughs> me going, okay, bye. <laughs> okay. <laughs> No, it should be. We read because reading is sexy. And if you're not reading, you're, you're not, not sexy. sexy. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Thanks for watching. <laughs>